Welcome back, everyone. I hope that you all had a great break for an hour. Now, without much ado, I would like to introduce the moderator for the next session. Judy Stuck is the Associate Dean for Library and Information Services and a senior lecturer at the JSW School of Law. She previously served as a research librarian and lecturer in law at Washington University School of Law in St. Louis. She also worked as a research librarian, head librarian, and office manager at the American law firm Jenkins and Gilchrist. She received her bachelor's degree from Northwest Missouri State University and her master's of library science from Texas Women's University and her Jewish doctor from DePaul University College of Law, USA. With this, I would like to hand over the floor to the moderator. Thank you, Ola. Thank you, Swang. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome back to the seventh session of the National Conference on Public Contracts. As Swang has already told you, my name is Judy Stark, and I'm the White and Case LLP Associate Dean for Library and Information Services, and I am the moderator for this panel. I would like to thank Professor Sonam Sering and the entire conference committee for inviting me to moderate this session. Our first speaker this afternoon is Professor Kunzang Doma, Professor Kunzang is a lecturer here at Jigme Senge Wangchuk School of Law, where she is currently teaching the alternative dispute resolution courses, including negotiation, mediation, and arbitration. And she's also the director of the Appropriate Dispute Resolution Clinic. Before joining JSW Law, Professor Kunzang worked as a legal officer for the Royal Government of Bhutan, a district administration PARO and district administration for Wangdu Fodrang. As a legal officer, she provided legal advice and represented two agencies in cases related to public contracts of works. She was also a member of the secretary of the Zongkog Tender Committee at District Administration for Wangdu Fodrang. Professor Kunzang holds a master's or LLM degree from the University of Missouri School of Law located in the United States and an LLB from, an, from Indian Law Society's Law College, Pune University, India and a PGDNL from the Royal Institute of Management. Professor Kunzang will be speaking on the topic of resolving contract disputes in Bhutan. Professor? Thank you, Judy. <clears throat> Presentation. A very good afternoon to everybody. Uh, as um, Ma'am Judy has uh, already shared, I'll be speaking on resolving public contract uh, disputes specifically related to public contract of works. Uh, let me just share a brief outline of my presentation. So I'll first discuss very briefly infrastructure, sorry, infrastructure development in Bhutan, um, disputes related to it, then the uh, dispute resolution mechanism that are available. And from the list, I will specifically zoom in on our arbitration and public procurement of works, then uh, its challenges. And owing to the challenges, there are changes undergoing in it. And we will, uh, not we will, I will, sorry, share my thoughts and concerns on it. And finally, uh, share my recommendations. Um, so infrastructure development, as we all have agreed uh, during this, uh, conference uh, is a priority to the government. We can see it uh, from our first five-year development plan where a uh, huge budget expenditure was specifically focused on roads. Then it was followed by uh, network and connectivity, as you can see, bridge construction, water supply, uh, sanitation, and many more. Uh, and the trend is continuing. And as Bhutan develops uh, more and more, we require different infrastructure. So we needed road, now we need expressway, we need flyovers. Um, uh, we need overhead bridges, we need, uh, we had sanitation, now we need uh, sewage treatment. Uh, we needed water supply, now we need water treatment plants. And in carrying out these constructions, sometimes complication happens, uh, which results in disputes. And 
disputes can cause delays and additional expenditures. So as you can see, these are some um, news that was highlighted in Kansa. Uh, so now we will take a look at how those are resolved. What are the options available? So we have a negotiation and mediation, as you must have seen in the contract document and in the public procurement rules and regulation about resolving disputes amicably. Uh, then the tender committee and the independent review bodies are government committees, which are authorized to provide decisions and uh, as a grievance uh, mechanism, to a redressal of grievance mechanism. Uh, then there is adjudicator, which is provided in the contract document. Uh, through my studies, I found that it's not used much, uh, but it's provided where the parties jointly appoint a third person to look at the dispute and the contract document always also provides uh, specific specifications as to when he, he or she should resolve the dispute, where, where can they appeal from. Then there is arbitration on which I will uh, focus more on in my next slide. And then lastly, court. Uh, so uh, this presentation uh, I forgot to mention is based on my paper. It's still work, I'm still working on it. So your feedbacks would be wonderful. Uh, so with regard to court, so in the 1980s and 90s, as per the senior engineers and retired engineers, disputes were rare. So uh, if there was disputes, they would try to resolve it amicably. And if it doesn't, then the option left was to go to court. Currently, arbitration is the form of dispute resolution available, and around it, there is specific role provided to the court. Now, we will zoom in on arbitration. Arbitration, uh, most, of it, uh, most of the people watching right now already knows, but I will just run through it. So it's a dispute resolution process where an independent, impartial third party is the dispute resolver. It, sometimes it can be a sole person, so a sole arbitrator or a tribunal. Usually the tribunal will consist of odd number of members. Uh, for cases of public procurement, the trend has been that the arbitral tribunal usually consists of three people, uh, where one, each party appoints one, one arbitrator and the two arbitrators, which are appointed by the party, appoints the third presiding arbitrator. Uh, arbitration has been provided in the contract document, that is the standard bidding document, that uh, decisions regarding uh, public uh, procurement of works disputes, arbitration will have the final say. Arbitration, as we all know, has its own sets of rules and procedure and a limited scope of appeal, which uh, our previous presenter, Tash Tenzin, has also shared on it. But I'll just run through it if there are others who've missed his presentation. So you can only set aside an arbitral award as per the Alternative Dispute Resolution Act of Bhutan if a party entered into it in incapacity, in uh, when the arbitration agreement itself is void, if there are challenges regarding the proceeding of the arbitration or the appointment of the arbitrator, if the award on the dispute wa was not supposed to fall under the purview of arbitration, if the subject matter was not within the capacity of settlement through arbitration, and if the award was against public policy in Bhutan. Um, so as you can see, there are limited scopes. So this uh, is very different from other forms of alternative dispute resolution, like mediation and negotiation, where party has control over both process and outcome. Uh, there is this issue with arbitration currently. Our government is dissatisfied with arbitration. They have, uh, especially arbitral awards, and they have uh, expressed that the reason as uh, the decisions of most cases that come from arbitration are unfavorable towards them. Um, through my study, I found a concern that was shared as to why maybe, the, not maybe, but the, the reason why decision may be unfavorable uh, to the procuring agency could be because of the incompetency of the representatives they usually send to arbitration. So as I've said before, arbitration is much more formal. Um, you would put out facts, you'd have to supplement with evidence, you have the option of calling an expert, uh, you, have, you can even call witnesses, so we can see how different it is from mediation and negotiation and how much it is, like everyone says, a private court. So, um, so when the capacity of the representatives is a challenge, then 
that could also that has also been attributed as reasons for why arbitral award must not be coming in favor of government agencies. The other concern that even earlier was shared was the ethical challenges. And uh, as ethics seems to be a very big problem in our construction or our public procurement, and that includes public procurement of work. Uh, ACC in 2012 has said that maybe around Neutrum 4.6 to 5.34 billion uh, government must be losing through, uh, because of corruption in public procurement annually, and that is a huge number. There are later reports which spe specifically focused on corruption in uh, public procurement of works also highlighted the risks of corruption. They even reported the increasing number of complaints, cases, and annually we can see the number of cases that are re regarding public procurement procurement of work that are awaiting prosecution and awaiting judgment. So uh, ethics is a huge challenge and sadly it has been carried forward in arbitration as well. So it is not just the procuring agencies represented just like engineers colluding with um, contractors, but it's also there are concerns that are shared with arbitrators colluding with engineers. And sometimes all three and the sad part is that uh, cases are lost because of ethical issues. Uh, be because of these, uh, these challenges, there's a change undergoing. Uh, so Ministry of Works and Human Settlement has recently in fact even started implementing it where they provide the option of taking the matter to arbitration or court and they are preferring to take the matter to court. Uh, my concern with this is firstly, um, if the issue really is about the representatives that the procuring agency sends to arbitration, then they will face the same problem in court and court will be much, much more formal. And then it will be the same issue again. My second concern here is uh, not all the cases that go, uh, cases that are there will be about uh, excess payment where the work has been completed, the uh, contractor has been paid more, so you're asking them to pay back. It could be cases or disputes that happen during the uh, course of the contract management. So if it's that is the case, we've already heard from Dashu Tenzin about how easy the appeal system in Bhutan is, and you can just see how long the process will take uh, and the cost that would incur. So in our context, it's not even about how willing are you to take that loss, the time loss and the cost loss, but how much can we afford that loss? So that is my second concern. Uh, the other change that is happening is this is, there's a, a construction bill that has not been tabled yet, but in the construction bill, bill, the proposal is to take the matter to an adjudicator. Now, my concern here is first of all, uh, the, the use of the service of adjudicator for dispute resolution is not very prominent. Most agents, procuring agencies don't even use it. They in fact put a, a clause, this clause as not applicable. The reason cited was uh, there's no professionally trained adjudicator. And uh, the contract document, which provides this option, doesn't talk much on the requirements of an adjudicator. It just says two parties can appoint an adjudicator jointly, and then it provides the process within how many days the matter should go to the adjudicator, when should the adjudicator give a decision, if you're aggrieved by the decision of the adjudicator, where to appeal. But all the code and conduct that we are having in arbitration could easily come in this. And then we will be again back to square one where we have adjudicators, uh, parties in corruption. And so uh, that is my thought on this. Now going for forward, uh, my recommendation is firstly, uh, if the challenge with regard to arbitration is because of the, the, the representatives, the procuring agency sends, then my suggestion is inclusion of lawyer. Now, when I talk about inclusion of lawyer, I don't mean it, uh, the moment a case comes, the case is dumped on the lawyer, but rather uh, because it's a contractual relationship, uh, from the get-go, when the contract is signed, the, I feel that the lawyer, in fact, from the 
because the contract do document is already drafted before you sign it, sending it to the lawyer, the lawyer being in picture from the get go. Uh, if there are hiccups on the way during the contract management or tendering process, including the, include the lawyer, maybe there are preventive steps that the lawyer can advise. Uh, it, it, it could also be because the lawyer is engaged early on, if it's a very technical sort of a dispute where the project manager or the engineer has to be involved, get them involved because they might be the right person, but all legal backing that is required can be provided by the lawyer. And uh, if the case really has to be dealt by the lawyer, the lawyer is much more uh, in the picture, much more prepared and really do justice to the case. Uh, this inclusion of lawyer, the other thing I wanted to talk, which uh, I've not said earlier, but uh, procuring agencies dissatisfaction with the arbitral award was also on the uh, reasoning and the deliberation that they provide. So in this as well, uh, Dashut Tenzin also touched on this. Uh, there is a need to include more um, lawyers if possible. If we look at the current uh, list of arbitrators, uh, lawyers constitute only 22% of the uh, domestic arbitrators. Uh, I think maybe one way to go forward is to have more lawyers more lawyers in the sense uh, to, uh, of the three people, two might be with technical expertise, the third might be a legal expert, which can help them sub give that right support. Uh, the uh, second recommendation is naturally, uh, ethics is a huge challenge. This has to be addressed. With regard to arbitration, um, Arbitrators specifically, uh, Bhutan uh, Alternative Dispute Resolution Act specifically provides the arbitral tribunal to be impartial and fair, and then the arbitrators to be impartial and independent. Uh, uh, before I say it, only uh, in the earlier discussion itself, it was highlighted people, uh, parties are losing, that parties may be losing confidence. Actually, uh, looking at, at the changes that are undergoing, we can say that parties are in fact losing confidence because of which this change is happening. So Bhutan ADRC Center should really tackle this. Uh, with regard to the other parties, that is the contractor and the procuring agencies, uh, with regard to contractors, both ACC and RAA, Royal Audit Authority have highlighted this issue. Um, but uh, it, sadly our private sectors uh, are also ha having challenges with ethical practices. Uh, the government should keep fighting and ethics is a, is a very important part that has to be uprooted. Otherwise, any other dispute resolution, if this practice, because it has become sort of a culture or tradition in the industry itself, will replicate in other dispute resolution uh, processes. The third is, this is, at least from my side, a long-term solution. Uh, carrying out a national survey, and I'm recommending Ministry of Works and Human Settlement to lead this. Uh, because they would have more access to the uh, procuring agency, specifically focusing on works. Uh, what this will do is they will get the right data, and with that data, yes, you're on time. Okay, with the right data, uh, they will be able to learn about the experiences of different uh, dispute resolution mechanisms that are available and the officers that were engaged in the dispute and learn from their experience what are their challenges. In fact, in this study, they can even include the judiciary, Bhutan ADR Center, CDB, all other institutions that is involved in their cases, uh, dispute resolution, uh, learning from their experiences, what their expect expectations are, what their challenges are. Maybe technical expertise is a challenge to all of them. Uh, why a national study is because instead of what I see right now is so arbitration doesn't seem to be working. The next thing they are doing is jumping to uh, the court. Uh, if I go by what is in the contract document so far, it looks like it's been quite some time, almost 20 years that they haven't got, gone to court. Uh, if there are a few cases that were accepted by the appeal, uh, that uh, that is some other discussion, but from what is there on the document, it seems like they haven't gone to court for almost 20 years. If that is the case, they don't know what they are going to get themselves into. And I've, as I've stated earlier, cost and time could be a concern. So instead of hopping from one uh, dispute resolution me mechanism to the other saying, oh, that doesn't work, let's shift here. The best choice would be to carry out a nationwide study and truly find a dispute resolution system that is effic efficient and effective 
uh, that addresses all their concerns and need. So an opportunity to tr truly tailor a dispute resolution me mechanism that would address their concerns and all these challenges. Last with that, I end. La. Uh, to all the uh, participants, I am so sorry to inform you, but I have an emergency because of which I have to leave. If there are any questions, any comment, comment or any feedback, uh, please do drop an email. Uh, I am Kim Zong Dolma. Uh, it, my email address is all, must be already with you all because I'm also one of the conference organizers. Last, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kinzong. Very interesting, very informative. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. That was, again, uh, resolving contract disputes in Bhutan. Very informative, very interesting uh, topic for discussion. Uh, so now let's move on to our next panelist. Our next panelist is Tashi DeLay, who will be joining us via Zoom. Tashi DeLay is the managing partner at Garuda Legal Services, a law firm based in Timpu, which has succeeded as a leading source of expertise in the legal arena providing unparalleled legal services and counsel to domestic and international clients. He is currently serving as a member of the Bar Council of Bhutan and is also registered as an arbitrator with the SARC Arbitration Council. Tashi has had extensive experience with prosecution and headed the prosecution division at the office of the OAG and is also a specialist with Save the Children International. He is an adjunct faculty member at Jigme Singe School of Law where he teaches evidence law. Tashi received his Master of Laws, or LLM, in International and Comparative Law with a focus on trade law from George Washington University Law School in Washington, DC. He has an LLB from Government Law College, University of Mumbai, India, and a postgraduate diploma in National Laws from the Royal Institute of Management. Today, Tashi will answer the important question, do the courts have the power to modify an award? Tashi, over to you. Um, thank you, Judy. Am I audible? Can you hear me, Judy? Yes, La. Thank yes, you, thank you. So uh, let me just share my PowerPoint slides. Okay, uh, it's... Uh, are you all able to view this, Judy? Uh, can you see this? Yes, and it looks really good, Tashi. Okay. Sure, thank you. Thanks a lot, Judy. And a very good afternoon good to everyone. Um, yeah, uh, so basically we've had, uh, I mean, since yesterday, we've had a, a series of discussions on procurement and procurement related issues. We've had discussions on the procurement rules and regulations, the way we, uh, enter into procurement uh, engagements. And today, I think right from the beginning in the morning, we've uh, had discussions on how do we actually resolve uh, 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 disputes relating to uh, public procurement. And uh, I would just like to inform you all that uh, much of what I have to present this afternoon has been uh, covered by Dashu Tenzin in the morning. And likewise, even I think uh, part of Kunzang's presentation this afternoon also uh, touched uh, a lot on uh, the res uh, resolution of disputes. And uh, my presentation, uh, what I have tried to do is uh, uh, basically focus on the finality of arbitral awards. The fact that we enter into an arbitration, we would want to ensure that uh, the disputes, once it gets resolved, there isn't recognition on the award, on the decisions that the tribunal gives. So in trying to do this, I've tried to basically uh, ask a question. And uh, uh, so what I'm trying to say is, do courts have the power to modify an award? And why I ask this particular question is, uh, we, we need to look at this question from the context of uh, three main issues, uh, especially uh, the fact that the ADR Act, the, uh, the Alternative Dispute Resolution Act, it actually provides for the finality of an award 
and the finality and recognition of awards. Firstly, that. And secondly, the role of the courts in an arbitration process. And ultimately, uh, the next context in which I would uh, pose this question is the, the, uh, the, the significance of the setting aside uh, the power of the courts to set aside an award and uh, the power of the courts to review an award. So basically, is the power to set aside awards under the ADR Act, similar to an appellate provision under the Civil and Criminal Procedure Court. So this is the question that I would like to pose forward. And uh, I see a lot of uh, legal uh, friends, lawyers, and also uh, other uh, participants who've been in the procurement sector. And uh, I'm sure everybody would be uh, in a position to share their experiences and how we actually go forward. So uh, just to give you all a, a context, uh, is my slide uh, moving? Yes, they are. Okay, great. So uh, basically, uh, when we talk about arbitration, I think again, uh, Mi'kmaq touched upon this, Kunzang touched upon this, uh, we have the Alternative Dispute Resolution <clears throat> Act, which was enacted in 2013. And then we had the establishment of the Bhutan Alternative Dispute Resolution Center, which was established uh, uh, very recently, uh, I think uh, in, in the two, uh, year 2018. The center actually provides for an uh, institutional arbitration. So basically what it means is that the center would maintain a list of arbitrators and uh, uh, the center would be actually facilitating the uh, conduct of arbitrations. And uh, prior to the CDB, uh, prior to the uh, uh, ADR Act, uh, we did have an interim uh, arbitral, uh, uh, which was actually carried out by the, Cent <clears throat> the Construction Development Board. And the focus was mainly to do with uh, construction related disputes. And one of the drawbacks, uh, which I personally uh, came across, I think there was no finality in the awards that was rendered by the uh, CDB arbitration. And what often happened was after the award was actually rendered, uh, the parties who were actually aggrieved by the award would actually uh, approach the courts and the courts would look into, uh, they would go into a de novo trial way where they would look into the merits, basically, uh, uh, I mean, uh, nullifying whatever had been done by the tribunal. So uh, when we talk about the ADR Act 2013, uh, it is based on the UNCTRAL model law, UNCTRAL, which is the United Nations uh, Commission on International Trade Law. And uh, uh, many of, uh, many jurisdictions today, they've actually tried to design their arbitration uh, uh, laws based on the uh, UNCTRAL model law. And uh, in, in Bhutan also, uh, I think uh, we've uh, almost, uh, we've tried to base a majority of our uh, uh, ADR Act on the model law. And the objective uh, under the uh, Act is basically to minimize the intervention of the courts. And uh, I, I think uh, the, the role of the courts uh, and the extent to which the courts have actually uh, tried to involve themselves in the arbitration process uh, has been, uh, I mean, touched upon by Dashtindi in the morning. So moving on, I think uh, I will not uh, really uh, uh, deal much, uh, go much into the details of why uh, arbitration is uh, a preferred uh, choice. Uh, and especially in the context, see, while uh, all over the world uh, where the move is uh, going towards an arbitrational tribunal and not to the courts. I think that the move over the last over the discussions over the last two days, I've uh, I uh, we've heard from participants why arbitration uh, is not working and why is there a need for people to actually resort back to the courts and uh, whether this move makes sense or not. Of course, this is a debatable issue, but the fact that uh, uh, arbitration as the process for resolving dispute in the country, it's uh, not uh, taking uh, roots as of today. So why would uh, we go for arbitration? And the first and the foremost uh, 
consideration that we give to arbitration is that we are saying it is an alternative to litigation and the award, the decision that is rendered by the tribunal, it's binding and can be enforced just like the judgment rendered by the courts. So how does the award become binding, final and binding? And this is in the context of what uh, the ADR Act says. So basically there are two conditions to be fulfilled in ensuring that the award becomes final and binding. The first condition to be fulfilled is the period for making an application to challenge an award. So basically we're talking about the right of the power of the court to actually set aside an award. And uh, for this, the what the law provides is uh, if you are, if you have an issue or if you need to challenge an award rendered by the tribunal, you would have to approach the courts. And the and the catch is this is not in the form of an appellate provision. What you would do is you would need to apply, approach the court and the high court in this particular case. Uh, in the case of domestic arbitration, you would have to wait for 30 days. And in the case of international arbitration, this would have to, uh, I mean, you would have to wait for 90 days. So basically what this is doing is, once this is done, then even if you are not happy with the outcome of the uh, case, there is nothing doing and you would have to abide by this. So that is how the courts would ensure that the award is binding in nature. So basically what it says is, and beyond 90 days and 30 days in case of domestic, is there still an opportunity for actually setting the uh, award aside? So what you would do is yes, and be, I mean, uh, there is another clause which actually gives you a further uh, additional cushion of 15 days. And this would have to be complied with uh, subject to the decision of the court that it, uh, it merits, a, uh, it is a genuine case which might need to be considered. So that is the binding nature. And in terms of uh, how you would go about, uh, again, the, the provision, the rights of the court to actually intervene in the uh, arbitration process, I think these provisions, uh, these the, the grounds were already touched in the morning, so no point going into the details. But what needs to be kept in mind is there are primarily uh, two reasons why an arbit uh, arbitral award could be set aside. And in the first instance, it basically says that uh, the option is given to the parties, whereby the parties would have to prove one of the grounds. And basically, it talks about uh, the lack of capacity of the parties, lack of a valid arbitration agreement. I think these were already touched upon by Dash Tenzi in the morning. And the second grounds on which, uh, and second, it's basically the courts on its own initiative. They can also review the uh, award rendered by a tribunal. And basically it talks, it, it talks about uh, non-arbitrability of the subject matter of dispute. Our law specifically, uh, specifically provides that certain matters like inheritance, matrimonial issues, insolvency issues, taxes, uh, these are certain things which the arbitral tribunal does not have the mandate to look into. And another issue is basically to do with public policy. And again, uh, with regard to public policy, it's, 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 a, shoe, it's a very, uh, the scope is not limited and the act has not actually uh, defined public policy. So it, this would be left up to the courts to actually determine what sort of uh, issues would fall under public policy consideration, which the courts can. So this uh, recourse against arbitral award, basically section 150 of the ADR Act, these are very limited grounds on which the courts can actually intervene into the award that has been rendered. Uh, given our uh, practice here in Bhutan, especially with we being in the private sector, a lot of uh, parties who've actually been through the arbitration process. We've uh, we come across a lot of people who actually feel that uh, they did not uh, get justice because they, 
their application, their petition to the High Court was denied because it did not come under one of these grounds. And the reason why they do this is probably due to the fact that they were not aware of the provisions. And even today, I think uh, there is a misunderstanding uh, among a lot of people, including the legal uh, fraternity, uh, especially with regard to whether Section 150 uh, under the ADR Act is in the nature of an appellate provision. So, so if you strictly uh, look at the wording of Section 150, it simply says that the the courts have very limited authority in which it can jump into uh, looking at the award. However, uh, in the morning, Dashutendin had clearly mentioned that the courts, for whatever reason, have in fact uh, uh, treated this section as an appellate provision. And what actually happens is the High Court has actually been looking into the merits of the case, which is uh, not the intention behind the uh, drafting of the law. So basically, when we talk about setting aside an award, now we are saying this is not an appellate provision. And if you do not fulfill the grounds under which the uh, award may be set aside, so what would happen after an award is set aside? So the, if you go through the provisions of that, this is something which is not very uh, clearly defined. But then uh, uh, the international practice basically says that once an award is set aside, I mean, the role of the courts is just to set aside an award. And once the award is set aside, what happens? So basically, if you are not happy with the award of the tribunal, what you would do is you would challenge. And how would you do that? You would file a uh, petition before the court. And if the court says, yes, the award needs to be set aside, then what happens? The dispute is not resolved. So then the parties, what do they do? They would have to look for a way out. Should they get back to the initial arbitral tribunal who actually resolve the issues? So many of these questions have not been uh, answered. And uh, in our context, uh, a very uh, a departure from what the uh, ancestral uh, model says, um, just to highlight, Section 153.2 uh, of the ADR Act basically talks about the High Court, the role of the High Court, and what it says is the High Court needs to confirm the award. Uh, technically, uh, as, I was, as I already pointed out in the beginning, if 30 days or 90 days respectively, if that elapses, the High Court may not necessarily need to confirm an award. And the... the departure from the accepted uh, uh, mode of actually setting aside. What the section uh, clause two says is, the high court may set aside the award in whole or in part and itself determine the matter. So now this is not there in the ancestral model and in many other parts of the world, what they do is they will want to limit the role of the courts. But here we have this particular provision which says that the High Court may set aside the award and itself determine the matter. Now, this is yet to be tested, this particular provision. How do the courts actually determine this matter? And uh, while the <clears throat> accepted practice with regard to setting aside an award is the courts should not actually involve themselves beyond the grounds actually laid down then in the act, I think. Uh, and uh, like Dasho Tenzi pointed out in the morning, we have very limited case laws which have acted. I mean, almost none of the cases actually uh, speak about uh, uh, detailing, uh, detailing how they would want to determine the case. So basically what I'm trying to say is, yes, our courts, they do involve themselves by looking into the merits of the case. But is this an accepted practice? Well, there could be arguments from both sides the courts might want to say that, yes, we have the power to actually determine the matter. And this might also include to the extent in which they would say that because the act has given us the power, we will want to look into the merits of the case. But then is this in accordance with internationally accepted practice? The answer is no, because uh, one of the main reasons why Aung Sitral was 
the amphitrial model was developed was to basically limit the role of the courts. So until such time, our uh, courts actually make a determination on these lines. So this uh, Dustin then had given his own uh, views as to why the courts would actually, uh, why the courts were actually uh, looking into uh, reviewing a particular case. But from the internationally accepted practice, is this valid? Is this legitimate? They are, I mean, uh, it could be uh, argued otherwise. So I think uh, I'm, I'm running out of time, but basically just last slide that I would like to highlight and uh, basically what I'm trying to say is these are not recommendations, but I, I would just like to say that this is uh, an observation that I've made. So what we are trying to say is uh, the fact that the ADR was modeled on the lines of the amphitrial model, uh, there should be very limited intervention from the courts. And uh, the courts need to take a stand on whether the setting aside uh, provision under the EDR Act is the same as an appellate provision. Until this particular provision uh, uh, issue is resolved, I think arbitration, I mean, almost all hours that the arbitral tribunals uh, uh, take out, these would invariably reach the high courts uh, as uh, as an appeal, uh, as an appeal case, and uh, ultimately, uh, as Dr. Tenzin pointed out, there are different uh, varying views as different benches of the High Court actually uh, dish out different judgments with regard to these. And until and unless uh, final case law is uh, uh, rendered by the courts in resolving this issue, I think this will still perpetuate. Thank you. And uh, we, we can take up the questions later on. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Tashi. Very interesting presentation. Okay. Uh, I believe we will move on to our third speaker for this afternoon. Uh, and our third speaker today is Amda Chinwangmo. Amda Chinwangmo is joining us via Zoom. And she is a senior procurement officer at the Procurement Management and Development Division under the Department of National Properties at the Ministry of Finance, where she monitors the implementation of the procurement rules and regulations, along with other supporting regulations and guidelines. She also provides advice to other government agencies on procurement. Am Ditchen has also carried out studies and advocacy on government procurement. She was also the project manager for the Electronic Government Procurement System Development. Om Detchen has a master's in business administration and is a member of the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply, MCIPS. She will speak on the topic of EGP, a path to digitalization of public contracts in Bhutan. Welcome, Detchen. Thank you, Judy. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Thank you. Okay, so let me share my screen. Uh, someone is someone has already shared the screen, so I'm not able to share here. Tashi Delisal, Okay, I'll share. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yes, looks lovely. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so first of all, I'd like to thank uh, JSW Law School for having me uh, in this conference. So without wasting much time, I'll start my presentation. Uh, this is the brief outline for my presentation. I'll be presenting, sharing a few points on the background, then introduction of EGP, how EGP came into place, then objectives, then who all are the stakeholders of EGP, then benefits of EGP, the length time uh, and uh, timeline of the system, and then status of the EGP as of now, and then what all are the procurement reform that uh, were carried out after the EGP system came in place, and then the way forward for our office. Law. So coming to background uh, on the EGP system, I'll be sharing you 
a brief background on the system. So Arjo, uh, the RGOB embarked on the e-governance initiative during the 10th five-year plan. This is how the EGP uh, initially was initiated. Then in 2017, uh, a study was conducted by World Bank on the pre-feasibility studies uh, on the EGP. And then the EGP roadmap master plan was drawn from it. And in 2017, a single portal procurement website was created as an initial step towards the EGP program. The program was also uh, again funded by the World Bank. And in the financial year 2014 to 15, under the phase three ICT capability development program, a preliminary study and review was conducted. Uh, the funding was from the Thamasic Foundation uh, of Singapore, uh, jointly funded by the Royal Government of Bhutan. The study and review included review of procurement rules and regulation and develop functional specification of the system. The EGP functional specification was developed uh, by involving various stakeholders from different ministries and departments, particularly uh, ICT officers and the procurement officers. After the EGP uh, functional specifications were developed, then uh, we started uh, tendering out uh, the development of the system. And the as our minister and uh, finance secretary pointed out yesterday that the system was developed phase-wise. The first phase was developed and rolled out in uh, 2017. And in 2020, we rolled out the EGP phase two. So basically what is EGP? So this is our logo, the system, uh, system logo. So EGP is an automation of manual tendering process, which was a paper-based procurement to online tendering process. So the tendering process can be carried out using a web-based application and uh, the users can avail the services free of cost. So the objectives, coming to objectives of the system, uh, the system is efficient. Uh, the system is available 24 seven hours and it is available uh, around the world. Anyone can access the EGP system. And uh, coming to reduction of cost, since uh, the tendering process is done online, there is no requirement for paper-based uh, procurement. So this will reduce time and cost. The second uh, objective is the system ensures wider competition among the bidders. Because the system is convenient and easy access, the number of bidders that uh, are participating in the tendering process has increased evidently since uh, the rollout of the system in 2017. So this has created wider competition uh, and it has created uh, great value for money for the procuring agencies. Uh, coming to third and fourth objective, uh, the system ensures fair and equal treatment to the builders as well as the system is transparent. Uh, the procuring agency, uh, if they want to share information to the builders, they, can, they have to share everything online. Uh, so there is no partiality of uh, dissemination of information to the builders, unlike the manual tendering process. Uh, the system is transparent uh, in terms of information, share, information sharing, then uh, in terms of uh, sharing of amendments by the procuring agency. Uh, the system ensures accountability. So in order to use uh, the EGP system, uh, the users will have to register in the system uh, using their email ID and password. So whatever they do in the system, uh, they are accountable to the system because their user identity is tracked down by their email ID and password. And as I have pointed out in the objective one, the system is easily accessible to anyone and it is accessible uh, all around the block. And coming to uniformity, the system 
uh, ensures uh, uniform uniform application of rules and regulations. Though we have uh, one rule and regulation, which is Procurement Rules and Regulations 2019, and its standard bidding documents. Uh, during offline tendering, uh, the procuring agencies had their own interpretation of rules and regulations. So this has led to uh, inconsistencies in the application of rules. So with EGP system, uh, the system is uh, developed in such a way that uh, the uh, procuring agencies have to uniformly apply the rules and regulations. They cannot even skip uh, the rules and regulations that are there in the PRR. Now, stakeholders coming to stakeholders, uh, we have uh, various stakeholders who, who are impacted by the system. Uh, the PMDD, uh, Procurement Management and Development uh, Division, is the pioneer of the system. We look after the system, we manage the system, we provide uh, training as well as help decks uh, for the system. And the first stakeholder of the system is procuring agencies. So in the procuring agencies, the users uh, include the members of tender committees, uh, evaluation committee, and um, the head of the procuring agency, which is also in the tender committee. The second stakeholder uh, are the bidders. So if the bidders, if they want to participate in the RGOB tendering processes, they'll have to get themselves registered in the system and participate in the bidding process. The third stakeholder is uh, development partners. Uh, as of now, um, currently we don't have uh, international procurement uh, option in the system. Uh, we In the third phase, we have ADB and World Bank uh, funded projects uh, where they can use EGP system for procurement purposes. And then finally, uh, the financial institutions. The financial institutions are used to update bid security and performance security in the system. So these all are the stakeholders of the system. Now, there are numerous benefits of EGP system. So I have listed down a few here. The first one is complete elimination of paperwork. Unlike manual tendering where the procuring agency had to make, have to make copies of bid documents to be sold to the bidder. Now uh, they can uh, prepare tender online. So there is uh, paperless procurement, uh, which leads to uh, time and cost saving. Now coming to arithmetical error, since all the calculations are being done by the system automatically, there is no human error in calculation of the uh, prices quoted by the bidders. So it also saves the time for the evaluation committee members. Now coming to complete submission of bid, uh, uh, this benefit uh, is for the bidders. So uh, the bidders, will, while they prepare the bid online, if they haven't completed uh, even one form, like if they haven't uh, filled up one form or if they haven't uh, submitted the bid security and uploaded the required documents, then they'll not be able to submit the bid online. La. So there'll be no submit button. So system ensures that there is complete submission of the bid. And uh, there is no dependence on the newspaper. Um, the bidders, if they want to look at the bid opportunities, then they can directly uh, go visit the homepage, the homepage of the system, and then uh, look at the bid opportunities published by the procuring agencies. And like I said in the earlier slide, the objective. Uh, in the objective slide, uh, the system is available 24-7, uh, so anyone can prepare their bid or participate in the bid any time of the day, la, which is uh, convenient. And uh, anonymous bidding, the system ensures anonymous bidding, la. this is for the bidders. The anonymity in the system is ensured because um, the bid that has been prepared and submitted by the bid are locked by the bidders using their email ID and password. So bid can be opened only after the time has been left. 
for the opening of tenders. So before the tender opening time, if anyone tries to log in and see who all has participated in the bid, they cannot do it. So system has already restricted as per the timeline. So till then, the number of bidders, the identity of bidders remain anonymous in the system. And finally, uh, if uh, we have already uh, uploaded certain documents in the system uh, during preparation of bid, so if that particular document has to be reused again, we can use uh, we can do that by going into the uh, common library folder. So which will also lead to reduce uh, reduction in time. Now timeline of the EGB system. So since uh, our finance secretary and Lempo was pointing out again and again that the system was developed phase wise, so these are the uh, these are the phase la, phases la, phase one two three. So phase one uh, was developed and uh, rolled out in 2017, and we had modules like EGP homepage registration. Tendering, debarment, uh, annual procurement plan, reporting, admin, e-learning, and procurement reforms. Uh, all these modules were in phase one. So after the phase one has been rolled out uh, and completed successfully, then we started with uh, the development of phase two. La. So phase two was rolled out in July 2020, and the uh, modules were grievance, a grievance redressal, system integration, enhancement to registration, reporting, and evaluation module. And for the third phase, uh, which is going to be rolled out on next year, 2023, the modules are as follows. Now we have supply order, contract management module, reverse auction, system integration with different agencies, and e-payment and e-invoice, then non-consulting services uh, and reporting on community contracting module. And then we have procurement under development partner finance uh, project, particularly World Bank and ADB. And then we have few reporting enhancement module. So uh, currently we are uh, developing uh, the phase three modules. So is, if everything goes as planned, then this uh, development will be completed by the end of this year. And then next year we will roll out after providing uh, training to all the system users. To share the status of EGP as of now, uh, we have 200 registered procuring agencies. The procuring agencies include uh, users from ministries, Dunkaks, uh, departments, um, Dunkaks, Tromdes, regional offices, autonomous agencies, and few Georgs. And we are uh, coming to integrated agencies. We have integrated our systems with six agencies. Uh, namely our RCC, then we have integrated our system with the MOEA, the trade license part, then CDB for uh, contractors license and evaluation, uh, e-tool, and DCRC for CID, and RAMIS for tax clearance certificate. And we have nine registered financial institutions with 509 financial institution users. And uh, since uh, the uh, rollout of the system in 2017, we have 8,950 tenders floated by different procuring agencies. And till date, uh, we have 4,822 registered bidders in the system. The registered uh, bidders include contractors, suppliers, and uh, consultants. Now coming to procurement reform, what are the uh, changes that were made from manual to e-procurement? Uh, in other terms, it is also known as business process engineering. Firstly, the online registration. So in the manual tendering process, the if, uh, for example, if the bidder wants to do a business, then they can obtain license from trade license. If contractor, they can obtain license from CDV. So they do not have to register anyway to uh, 
participate in the turning process. La. Now with the EGP system, they will have to get themselves registered with the EGP system to participate in the tenders. La. And same goes to procuring agencies. La. So the uh, procuring agency users uh, include members of tender committee, uh, the head of the procuring agency, the engineers, and the evaluation, evaluation committee members. La. So they will also have to register in the system to float the tenders uh, and evaluate. La. The second one is publishing of tender. La. In the manual tendering process, uh, the procurement officers or procuring agency gives, us, gives out information in the media about the tender opportunities. La. Now with the online system, any tender that the procuring agency has prepared will go uh, get published in the EGP system homepage. La. So everyone can access uh, the tender which are live and then are ready to participate, ready to be participated. La. And coming to online bid submission, in the manual tendering process, uh, the bidders, what they do is they prepare all the bid uh, manually, they photocopy, uh, they photocopy the bid documents, make two copies of each document, and then manually go to the procuring agency's offices and then submit their bid uh, in person. Now with the uh, EGP, they don't have to come to face to face with the procuring agency. They can directly prepare their bid, open EGP website, prepare their bid online, and then submit their bid online. And then coming to evaluation and opening an award, everything is done online. Uh, unlike manual tendering, where the evaluation used to take like uh, two weeks or opening uh, one day. Now with the online uh, opening and evaluation, the opening takes only a few seconds. Uh, the tender preparer can open the tender within a few seconds. And then evaluation also, it is done online. Uh, and so uh, even for the award, contract award is also done online. La. And then the furnishing of performance security and bid security uh, is, is also done online. La. So what bidders have to do is before submitting the tender online, they have to go to the bank, provide tender ID, and then uh, provide uh, their with security to the bank, and then the bank people will update the information in the system. Now, this is my last presentation. I hope I'm on time. Uh, the way forward, uh, since uh, the PMDD office is in the third stage, third phase of EGP development, we are yet to test, uh, carry out user acceptance test, and then after uh, carrying out the test, then we are yet to train the procuring agencies, uh, procuring agencies like the committees and the procurement officers or other admin who are involved in the procurement process. Uh, and then uh, we are yet to train the bidders, all the suppliers, contractors, and consultants. Uh, and finally, roll out the phase three. Uh, second way forward is we, uh, uh, if everything goes well, uh, we are planning to open our tenders uh, internationally. As of now, the system is only applicable for the um, uh, Bhutanese bidders. Uh, the international bidders are uh, not accepted in the system. So we are planning to have international procurement options in the EGP system. And then uh, we are looking at uh, how to improve our system continuously by getting feedback uh, from the system users periodically and then enhancing them uh, to make the system more robust and um, user-friendly. Uh. So uh, this is the last slide. Uh, this is our website. Uh. You can visit our EGP website, www.egp.gov.bt. Uh. So thank you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, I'm handing this uh, platform to you. Thank you. Thank you, Amdechen. That was a lovely presentation. Very interesting. Uh, we're having a bit of difficulty with power here at the moment at the Taba office. 
So uh, please, uh, please bear with us as we, we work out some of the electronic uh, uh, joys. Um, let's see if we have any questions out there. Anybody have any questions for us? Hello. Hello. Can I ask a question? Hello. Uh, yes, please. Uh, thank you, Judy, for giving me this opportunity. I have a question regarding arbitration uh, to Autashi uh, Dele. I would like to uh, uh, give a situation. We have a unique situation. Uh, it's actually based on the rail issue uh, about the arbitration, where there was not even arbitration award by the tribunal. So it is a mm. case where uh, one of the parties procuring agency. So there was dispute and the dispute was registered with the ADRC and the appointment of the arbitrators have been done. So basically in principle, the arbitration, arbitral tribunal is set. What happens after that is the parties don't turn up, uh, not from the claimant side, but from the defense side. So in such situation, uh, what the claimant they do is they run to court and ask for remedies. Again, the court says that uh, we do not have the jurisdiction because uh, the arbitration clause is specifically outside the jurisdiction of the court. So in such scenario, there was no remedies. And this kind of a situation uh, recurs again and again. And of course, we advise them, uh, from, uh, the OEG advised uh, at, uh, at best, but there was a situation. So in this regard, um, forget about the arbitral award. There was no even uh, this uh, uh, award. And uh, what the arbitral tribunal did is they simply dismissed the case, uh, issued the order of dismissal, dismissal order. So in such situation, uh, I would like to, my question to Outtesh Dili is if you uh, were an arbitrator in, in such uh, cases, if you were a member of an arbitral panel, so what uh, sort of a decision would you uh, make? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stange, for appointing me as a member of the arbitral tribunal. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, Sange's question is basically, um, uh, see, uh, to get straight to the point, I think uh, I, I personally feel what the arbitral uh, tribunal did was correct. no uh, Sange. And the reason why I'm seeing this, we are basically seeing is arbitration is an alternative to a litigation. And uh, one of the key, uh, one of the main characteristics of arbitration we've been seeing is the consensual process. And here, see the, and I, I think uh, again, uh, taking it back to what Migmar was saying early in the day, the problems with regard to mandatory arbitration clause that you have in the uh, procurement uh, contracts. Here, the very fact that we say arbitration is, is a consensual process, uh, the parties, both the parties should have actually be willing to enter into an arbitration agreement and then uh, have, their arbitra uh, have their dispute resol uh, resolved through, uh, through arbitration. And uh, when, when you do this, the, both the parties have to willingly come together forward, right? And uh, I, th I think uh, the, 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 the situation which you describe, it uh, basically seems to suggest that the parties were not willing to come. And uh, I think uh, the best solution that the tribunal can, uh, could have done was to dismiss the case. So uh, I, I don't know whether uh, I've answered your question, but uh, I think uh, I would have done the same thing too, Sange. Let's, let's thank you. Thank you for sharing your opinion. Uh, Perhaps you would want to seek the view of the uh, judge <laughs> if Dashdindi is around. Yes, definitely. If that would be the case, it will be helpful to all of us. Dashdindi, are you online? La? I don't believe he's here this afternoon. Oh, okay. No worries. So.
Okay. Do we have anybody else who has a question? Any questions from the audience? Uh, may I look? Yes, Sona. Yeah, this is uh, not exactly a question, but uh, but a kind of uh, problem we face, uh, especially at the phase of appeal uh, for the uh, arbitral award. So, like uh, what Autashi Autash Dilek was explaining, uh, in a sense, in the principle of laws, like that is the exact thing that is uh, that should happen in Mewala. But, uh, and exactly what uh, Sir has pointed out is like uh, both uh, comparing to the, uh, going by the international law and the, uh, the, the domestic law, the power or the authority that the court have, have is to set aside the award and not to exactly to go, uh, go uh, to review the award or to modify the award. However, uh, when we go for the, uh, go for the appeal, we are, we are like our appeal submissions are expected to come with our expectation for the courts to review this and not, to, uh, not exactly, uh, not exactly or solely to like set aside sailor. We are expect, expected in that way, that way la. because we, I uh, like in, even in my case, I, I try to go directly to uh, asking the court to set aside, but it is not exactly, uh, uh, entertained or maybe like we are asked to like uh, uh, amend the app app uh, applications and all. So what is your view on that, Lassa? Uh Thank you, Sonam. Uh, I, I, I can uh, feel your frustration. Uh, I empathize you. <laughs> so basically, uh, Sonam, I think uh, uh, your frustration seems to arise from the fact that the courts are not clear as to whether the, I mean, basically, uh, I think uh, you also mentioned that appeal. I think the very fact that we all need to uh, reorient ourselves is when you actually go, uh, go to the high court with uh, application for setting aside an award, I think what we need to make uh, clear is that you are taking an application for setting aside an arbitral award and not an appeal petition for the courts to actually review the merits of the case. I think if we start doing this, because like I said in the morning, uh, many of, I mean, we in the legal fraternity, uh, I mean, uh, it is to do with technicalities, but the, the by way of argument, when we, uh, uh, when we talk to each other, you always say, I am taking, uh, I'm going to the high court for appealing against the award. I think we should critic ourselves, member, because there is no issue of appeal from an award. What you would want to do is, you would want to say that I would want to file an application for setting aside an award. So first that. And secondly, the issue it, uh, deals with the lack of understanding of the provisions of the law and the lack of the interpretation by the higher courts as to how we should actually go about interpreting this particular provision. So uh, th that's why uh, the uh, suggestion that I need to make more in the morning uh, when we talk about uh, the, the public's confidence in arbitration as a alternative dispute resolution process, because in today's uh, context, you ask anyone, if you give them an opportunity, they will uh, willingly opt out of an arbitration clause. And that is why we have, uh, forget the uh, private entities, even to the extent that the government does not have uh, faith and confidence in uh, the arbitration process. That is why they've come up with this new revised uh, provision in the procurement rules, which basically says that you have the option of actually uh, opting out of arbitration and uh, instead uh, resorting to courts, which would, uh, which would be unheard of in other countries because the move is towards taking the litigation out of the courts. Uh, does it make sense, Sonam? I don't know. So that, 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 just sharing my view on that. Yes, like, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Last of all. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, we have one raised hand out in the audience. Let's see if we can. Pema. Hi, Judy. Kuzambola, uh, everyone. This is Pema. And I must um, um, mention in the outset that I am not a lawyer. I teach at GSW Law, but I am a non legal faculty member. I teach philosophy and political science, and I have religiously attended all the conference right from yesterday. And I must say that I'm a layman when it comes to all this legal terminology. Although I've heard all these terms like arbitration and litigation, now I think I'm beginning to get a little sense of it, but I'm not so sure whether I've really understood it. This morning when Mi'kmaq was presenting about arbitration, and then I saw a comment made by Dasha Tenzin, probably I saw a comment made by Dasha Tenzin saying that the court may not be able to entertain arbitration because the court will have to see the reason behind uh, all the cases. If, if the cases does not have a genuine reason or if it's illogical, it may not be entertained. So I was wondering that if in arbitration, which I'm assuming is outside the court, if things like um, irrational um, 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 what would be the term, a kind of a, um, I, I couldn't get a proper um, legal term, but I was wondering if, if the dispute could be settled arbitrarily, meaning that if it is accepted, even if it is not rational in the true sense of the term, this, this is to all the lawyers here. Maybe I'm wrong in grasping it because even looking at the word arbitrary itself, uh, maybe in simple terms, it's, it's known as discretion. So I was wondering if irrational um, um, settling can be accepted. Sorry if I make no sense. <laughs> Uh, alas, uh, thank you, Pema, sir. Uh, uh, I'm not sure whether you, that question was directed to me, but I think uh, I'll take this opportunity and try to respond to you. See, basically, um, and uh, uh, I think you were basically trying to relate arbitration to arbitrariness. Uh, if, if, I, if I understood your question correctly. So please note that there is no link between these two. Here we are trying Arbitration is basically, I think, uh, the closest English word that you can bring it to is to arbiter, means trying to uh, get in between. And arbitrariness is basically uh, trying to say something which is uh, totally done against the accepted norms, accepted laws. So uh, I, I think, uh, uh, I mean, if I understood you correctly, just to point out that arbitration and arbitrariness has no link in it. La. And I think uh, the reason why uh, Tashit Enzi had mentioned about the courts not having the right to actually take up the cases on merits of the case, uh, uh, the, the very idea that we take arbitration, I mean, in arbitration, we take the disputes out of the court. What we are trying to say is once the parties have come together and decided that the dispute would be resolved outside the courts, there is no reason why the courts should after the tribunal having done everything at the, uh, at the tribunal level, there is no reason why the court should again actually look into the merits of the case. Of course, it doesn't again mean that if the arbitrate, uh, arbitrators, if the arbitral tribunal is found or seen to have uh, uh, gone beyond the procedural norms of uh, acceptability, uh, then uh, that is why uh, when the law actually provides for the second grounds on which an arbitration award can arbitral award can be set aside. You talk about the public policy doctrine, and uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, what exactly amounts to public policy is not yet explained. But uh, according to the reading of the internationally accepted models, what they prescribe is something which has which flouts the principles of natural justice law. That is basically what we are saying: is the both parties should be heard. If these sort of considerations have not been met then it becomes a ground for the cost to actually set aside an award. So uh, anyone else would want to add to or respond to Pema Sarla?
I think that was a, a very good description, uh, Sir Tashi, about what exactly the, the nature of arbitration is and uh, uh, the difference between that and and arbitrariness. Um, it's a very interesting kind of uh, uh, philosophical uh, thing to think about today. Really interesting. Thank you, Pema, for that question. Thank you so much. That was <laughs> enlightening. Okay, anyone else with any other questions? Okay. Oh, we have one raised hand. Kuzumbula, sir. I have a question to the uh, Tashid Lisa. The finality of uh, the arbitral award seems to be the, seems to be a uh, kind of a norm that must be respected by the court. That seems to be the, position under the international law. However, if you look at section 153.2 of the Arbitration Act, there is a phrase uh, itself determined the fact. So I wonder if the court can only set aside the award, what is it that the court might have to do under this provision? Lass, uh, an excellent question, Lakamasa. I think, uh, uh, earlier during my presentations, because of um, uh, due to the limitation in time, I had to actually rush through. Nice. So yeah, I I think I did touch upon this hundred section one hundred and fifty three clause two. Uh, like you pointed out, if you were to look at it in isolation, then it could be uh, it could be argued that this particular provision gives the high court, I mean, the court to actually look into the merits of the case. But then the argument that I am putting forward is that the ADR Act was based on the Anxitral model law. And uh, if you, the, the explanatory notes under the Anxitral model law, which many uh, countries in different jurisdictions have adopted, what they are trying to say is the very purpose of the, uh, of, recognizing and enforcing arbitral arbitration and arbitral awards is to put a limitation on the role of the courts. So, and uh, keeping into context, the overall statutory scheme of drafting uh, the argument, while we are saying that we base it everything on the international practice, which talks about uh, minimum intervention of the courts, we then come about, uh, come about drafting this section 153 clause two, which basically tries to uh, suggest that the courts have the mandate and the authority to review the merits of the case. Now, how do you actually balance these two? So that is why I'm saying in the absence of any sort of interpretation from the courts with regard to how we go about uh, interpreting this particular provision, we will keep facing these sort of challenges. And the issue is, uh, very pertinent today because Rashid Enzin has said, there's so many cases which have actually reached the high court and none of the uh, courts, none of the benches have actually tried to resolve this particular issue. They simply, I mean, outright you, so the first issue, even prior to that, the issue that needs to be resolved is whether the setting aside provision under the ADR Act, is it in the form or is it in the nature of an appeal provision? So these sort of issues until and unless, so that's why, in my presentation at the end, I said it is concluding observations. I'm not really uh, making any suggestions of whether how do we go about, but this basically is a food for thought for us legal people, for us people who are in the procurement um, uh, areas, how do we actually go about resolving this issue? Because ultimately, if you let the courts keep on intervening, then does it really serve the purpose of actually taking this uh, Arbitrary, sorry, uh, does it really make sense to arbitrate outside the courts? Thank you. That's very chill. Less so. Less, less. Okay, thank you. Thank you again, Sir Tashi. That was a very interesting answer. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, if, ma'am, if I, if I may supplement a little bit, a little bit on Sir Tashi Delikla. Certainly, uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, the confirmation of uh, the uh, the court's power to just to set aside is, I think, it is given right under the uh, uh, under this uh, section fifty three one uh, section one hundred fifty four 
There it reads as an appeal from setting aside or re refusing to set aside an arbitral award under section 153 of the act shall lie to the Supreme Court of Bhutan. So there it doesn't say about if there is any modification or review or any more uh, uh, anything done on the award can be appealed, but specifically mentioned as setting aside. So I think it, uh, that that confirms or reaffirms that the, the authority of the High Court is just to set aside Sinomela. Uh, thank you, Sanam, for sharing your views. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for such interesting conversation about this topic. Uh, it is 324, and although it is a little bit early, I think we will uh, take a break now and rejoin the session at 345. Again, thank you, everybody, for participating. I'd like to especially thank uh, Sir Tashi DeLay and uh, um, Denshin, and we will uh, rejoin everyone at 345. Thank you very much.